Let's try that again. Good morning, Church in the Pines. Good morning. Look at all these smiley faces. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Church in the Pines. Whether you're here in front of me, downstairs, online, we are so glad that you've chosen to uh, worship with us this morning. Welcome. If you're new here, we would love to know that you are here. So in when you walked in, you should have gotten one of these. And there's a little tear-off section. This is if you've never been here before. I'm switching again. Keep talking. If you've never been here before, um, this is an opportunity for you to let us know that you're here. Um, you can put your information on here, your email, stay connected to Church in the Pines. You're going to see with my announcements this morning, we have a lot going on, and we want you to stay connected, so please fill that out. If you've been coming a long time and you have a prayer request or you want to volunteer, you have questions, you can also fill that out and someone will get back to you. So our next set of announcements are about membership. If you've been coming for a while and you aren't a member yet, we would love to connect with you and let you know what it means to be a member here at Church in the Pines. So we do have an upcoming membership um, meeting. So if you're interested, they're going to start in April. You can email the church office at cipsecretary at churchinthepines.org and get on that list. If you're already a member, we do have Constitution and Bylaw Review Committee that's meeting on April 2nd from 6 to 8. And we also are going to have our all-church annual meeting on April 10th at 7 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. So we hope if you're already a member that you'll put those dates on your calendar and you will join us for those. Our next set of announcements are about missions. So we've talked a lot about missions. Missions is such a wonderful opportunity. This is such a mission heart church. Um, and we do have two groups that are going to be going on missions. And you might not be going on the mission trip, but you might be feeling called to be a sender. So we have opportunities for both. Um, we do have a fundraiser coming up on April 6th. That's one way that you can be a sender for these mission trips. Um, it's April 6th at 6. We do have QR codes available that you can scan and reserve your seat for that. And we do need your donations. So if you feel like God has put it on your heart to be a part of this opportunity, you can designate um, on one of our offering envelopes that this is for the missions. We'll make sure that it goes to that fund. Um, if you are giving today, we know that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. If this is your first time here, you're not a member here, please don't feel compelled to give. Um, but God does call each of us to give out of what he's calling us to give. And so we'd like to give you that opportunity. We do have offering boxes in the doorways and downstairs that you can leave your offering. And our very last, can you believe it is Palm Sunday? Amazing. It's Palm Sunday all right today. We have Easter in one week. So on your seats or near you, you should have a small card. And the first side of the card is about our Easter egg hunt. So the Lord's provision provided, we didn't, it was supposed to be Saturday yesterday. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Um, so it was, it's now next Saturday. It's going to be at the property um, in Middleborough. So this doesn't do us any good after this week. So I want you to take it with you. Do not leave it on the seat. Take it with you because there's two things you need to know. One is we need volunteers for the day of. So if you're part of our church, you'd like to get to know the community, be a part of this community outreach, please come. We have 175-ish um, treat bags full of candy. We've got hundreds of eggs that we need to hide at the property. We'd like to offer the community some fun games like bunny hops and egg races and crafts to do that day. Um, it's only two hours. We're asking volunteers to join us at the property at 8.30 in the morning on Saturday. We have a sign-up sheet downstairs just so we can stay connected to you, send you some email reminders, find out what it is on your heart, how you want to volunteer. So we would love to connect with you that way. But on the other side, it's a handy-dandy dual, you know, two things in one. This is amazing. On the other side, Easter services next week, 9 and 11. You can hand this to someone and you can invite them to two things at once. Isn't that amazing? And after this week, it's no good. So do not leave it on your seat. Take it with you. Whoever God puts it on your heart this week to invite to church, please hand it to them. They can take it with them. We have 9 and 11 o'clock service. 9 o'clock is when we'll have junior church. So if you're a regular attender and you'd like your children to go to junior church, please plan on the 9 a.m. service. We also are going to have fellowship in between those two services. 
And what Lisa Holmes and the Kitchen Committee would like you to know is we would love additional treats because Easter is one of those times we know people may not come to church every week, but a lot of people will come on Easter. And so we want those, we have those two services. We want plenty of opportunity and we want that fellowship time in between the two services. And we need extra treats. So please see Emily Eubanks, Crystal Johnson, Lisa Holmes, Joan Miller, or Janet Wilson. Um, before you leave today, they have a little reminder for you because we have only have one week and we would love to have you bring some treats. And I think that is everything. See, I told you we've got a lot going on at CIP. We have a lot going on. <laughs> Our verse for today, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever leaves by believing, lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? John 11, 25 through 26. Uh, would you pause with me and pray before we turn to worship? Lord God, I just thank you for this Palm Sunday and this holy week that we're about to enter. I just pray, Lord, that you would prepare our hearts for the service today, uh, for the things that you have for us to hear from you. Um, Lord, I pray that we would have open minds and open hearts, that we would allow your spirit to move um, and just have us have openness uh, to all that it is that you have for us during this service, Lord. I pray for the message, for the worship, all the ways that we worship, Lord, through giving, through song, uh, through listening to your word, that would all be honoring and glorifying to you. And we give this time to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us and worship, please?
blessed spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind to me
no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, breathless love of God. Oh, it chases me. Alone in my sorrow, dead in my sin Lost without hope, with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began Ash was redeemed, only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace, so free, washes over Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom, he faithfully bore. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death goes arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over. Rejoices though heaven had lost. Lord, we just praise you today. Palm Sunday, God. And you rode into town and you showed everybody that the prophecy was to be fulfilled and was unfolding in front of their very eyes. Oh, what a day that must have been. I know that we we see the glow of of your presence and people that have stood in your presence long enough, God. 
I can just imagine the glow of our Savior coming into town, just saying, here I am. God, we just praise you today. We praise you for all the gifts that you've given us, and we praise you that, that we get to bless others with what we have. And we pray that we give in whole and humble hearts, contrite hearts, God. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. When death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over.
morning. I apologize. I am fighting an illness. It sapped me. So if I, if I, if I didn't shake your hands this morning, it's a good thing. I only, t I only took out Ron, so Ron's going to be hurting. Um, <laughs> so uh, the Haiti report, uh, I was listening last month that uh, Haiti is, um, is compared with Gaza. What's going on in Gaza with the attacks going on? They said that's what's going on in Haiti. The warlords are, are in the midst. They're going attacking it, and it's crazy. So people are asking me, what's going on with our church? What's going on with our sister church down in Haiti? And I like to say, I love that last song, um, God is faithful. No matter what situation, whatever situation you are right now, dealing with a cold, minor, <laughs> dealing with hardships, dealing with pain, God's faithful. God's faithful. And what's amazing is when I'm talking to Pastor Bell is there down in our church, sister church down in Haiti, you get that sense. God's faithful. His prayer was, Henry, um, things are moving. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I know. No, no, God's moving. I'm going down in the neighborhood, and I see God moving. And I'm just like going, how are you doing this? How are you thinking this way? And he's saying, he's saying, please pray for us because God is moving in our church. God is moving in our community, and we want to be faithful. That's amazing to hear him to say that. A place like Gaza, and he's saying this. Um, he's basically uh, saying that, he, and basically he said that uh, the church is celebrating. Every time there's a big influx of new members, they're celebrating. And so it goes, hey, we're having a celebration uh, this month. Ten new members are coming Pray for that. That's going to be a praise. I'm like, that's awesome. People are coming to Christ, even in the midst of all this horror that's in Haiti. Please pray for our um, sister church. Another prayer request for him was that he, he they, they take care of a, they run a elementary ch school, and they're underpaid. It's just we, we, we give as much as we can. But he goes, you know, I really want the year's about to end. I really want to give him a gift. And our church was said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to supply that. So um, pray for our teachers down, down there. But we gave last month uh, a gift, and they sent us back uh, the response of teachers of getting that gift. And so we want to be faithful uh, taking care of this. Another prayer request, and this is hard, um, they need Creole Bibles. You know, you know, when you think about America, you can get Amazon, boom. Uh, the things going on in Haiti, you can't go to the major city and get Bibles in their language. 
And so they were like, we got to find ways to get Creole Bibles in there. The, ch- the two pastors, the two main pastors, Pastor Belazer and Pastor John Will, gave their Creole Bibles away. Like, we don't even have Bibles for us. We gave it away. They have French Bibles, but people don't really speak French. Their first language is Creole. So, um, so they're look- we're looking for ways. We got Marie on that. <laughs> Marie's going to take care of that. But we're looking for ways of trying to get Creole Bibles to Jack Mel. When warlords taking over, they shut down any kind of resources, food, any transportation. How do we get that there? It's huge. So giving money, extra money to the teachers is huge because everything right now, the prices are up. Prices are crazy. So even that little gesture we have. So for, for us, lots of things to pray about Haiti. But we pray for their safety, pray for uh, their ministry. We pray that God is continually healing and bringing people, that God is faithful even in the midst of all these things. And I hope we get that in ourselves. When we come in America, we think, oh, my goodness, the world's God is working. Oh, the world's going. God is working. God is faithful. So we got to be reminded. When we look at our sister church, we got to be reminded that the present situation we are in does not dictate how faithful God is, Right? The present condition that we are in right now does not dictate God's faithfulness, God's love, that reckless love. we got to remember that, and I think that's what uh, the church is in Jack Mel's teaching us. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your reckless love. We thank you that, that uh, as the world goes crazy, as the world goes bonkers, we can turn to you. We can be. Uh, we can be. We can be stabled and supported and founded and be lifted up by your love. Help us to continue to turn to you in every situation, every situation. And we look at our brothers and sisters in Haiti. We look at Pastor John Will, Pastor Belzer, and we ask them that w- they will be faithful to doing the work down there, that as things are moving, as people are moving, as people are turning to Christ, they are there to gather, to grow, to move. We pray for their schooling. We ask that uh, more funds will come in for their schooling, uh, that kids will be turned to Christ. We pray for uh, just the, the horrors that's going on there. We ask for safety, Father. We thank you that we can partner up with them and we can learn from them about your faithfulness. We praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, family. Uh, I haven't been ill, but we've been away. Um, we thank God for Tam and I had 2,500 miles of safe travel and visiting family and friends who've um, put loved ones to rest and others who have welcomed new life into their homes. So we stand amazed. and. Uh, all the songs. Uh, how many of you read online uh, Pastor's Weekly Letter to us? How many of you read it? We see quite a few. Um, but there were several parts to it, and they were each prefaced by the phrase, I have a dream. And uh, <laughs> my memory won't serve me well right now. I'm always trembling in your presence more in his presence, but uh, one line I remember is that we not just sing, but the words that we sing are words of of worship, and uh, so, so much on our hearts and minds today. We thank you for your thoughts and prayers. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this morning we come before you, some of us destitute. In some ways, all of us destitute. We stand so utterly amazed at the wonder of life and all it it entails. Um, As I stand here this morning, I I reflect over just not just the past few weeks and years, but even just today, I think of uh, the Otley family who 
put a dear loved one to rest this week and suddenly and others also are utterly amazed. I think of that first song we sang, Love So Amazing. And uh, we thank you, God, that uh, you came to rescue us for me. We thank you, Lord, that you are our blessed Redeemer. I think of that line in the first song, do you believe this? All amazing God, we think of life. And uh, to think of another line that even before we took a breath, <laughs> I can't imagine you were singing over each one of us. Uh, I think it's so difficult to grasp just the depth, the depth of your love beyond comprehension. Thank you for Henry's words and, and those of us that have paid attention to the news that Haiti is in enormous turmoil. And the thought I had, Lord, this week is one of the leading terrorists. It's a man nicknamed Barbecue. Some of you have heard that name. Some of you have seen him on t television, on the news. And this week I've, I've pondered the thought that you love us all, even those of us that reject you. The thought that you love barbecue as much as you love any of us. That's just a bit of the extent of your love. So we pray for Haiti, and uh, we have no idea what's happening in a solution, but you have a plan. So we lift up those folks in Haiti. Pastor Bell is there in the church. We lift up folks in Somalia and the Sudan, and the Gaza Strip, and the West Bank, all of Israel and Palestine. We lift up those that in the Ukraine, what a, what a sad and desperate situation, the bombing, the bloodshed, the screams. We don't hear them here. We live relatively safe. And so we just lift them up, God. We thank you, Lord, for peace that passes all understanding in the midst of whatever we might be going through. For our church, thankful so much for everyone who comes out, everyone who continues to seek you, upstairs, downstairs, online, in our neighborhoods, near and far. So we give you thanks. We give you praise. We thank you for Pastor Gray's uh, successful trip to um, Bangladesh, a country where over 98% are Muslim or Hindu. Less than 1% are Christian. And we thank you that he's had an opportunity to go and to, live a, to deliver messages of hope and encouragement and strength uh, to those that he was able to serve. We thank you for their safe return. And uh, well, Lord, there's so much, much more. But we thank you, God, that you can invade our lives you can invade our circumstances and that you bring hope, not only for now, but for eternity. So we give you thanks. We give you praise. I thank you, God, that you can tear down all barriers and that we can come here on level ground before you and each other, that we might encourage and strengthen one another in whatever way possible. Well, so much, God, for this and much, much more. We thank you. We praise you. We commit it all to you. In the powerful and precious name of Christ, our risen Savior, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to be back. I enjoy going to places like Bangladesh, but I always enjoy coming back as well and seeing 
um, your wonderful faces and being able to connect with you once again. Today is Palm Sunday, and if you have your Bibles, I would invite you to find Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. We're going to be looking at Jesus' triumphal entry. <clears throat> Have you ever been in the presence of a very famous person? Um, I'm trying to think for this crowd here. I might not tell the story in Bangladesh or Burkina Faso, but many of you might remember in the 1980s and 90s, and it might have continued on after that, but I wasn't here. But there were the um, Congress meetings in Boston at the Heinz Convention Center. Probably some of you have attended those in the past, and um, I attended those several times. And one time I was at the Heinz Convention Center and the elevator came down and out came a very tall man who plays basketball for a brief time in Boston, but also for some other teams. And I was standing there looking at the belt of Bill Walton. <coughs> I was in the presence of a famous person and I actually recognized him because I follow sports and I knew who he was. Isn't it amazing that Jesus was probably, not probably, Jesus was the most significant person that ever lived. But so many times and so many people were in his presence but did not recognize who he was. Many of you will remember the very first story when Jesus begins his public ministry. And he goes into the temple and they offer him the scroll. He opens the scroll of Isaiah and he reads the famous passage speaking about the Messiah and the Messiah's ministry, about preaching the good news to the poor, about liberating the captives. And Jesus reads that famous passage. He rolls up the scroll and he says, this passage is fulfilled in your presence. And then he sits down. And you realize that what Jesus had done was to declare himself that day in that crowd of people that had come to the synagogue. He had basically said, I am the Messiah. And when Jesus taught, people were amazed. People were amazed at how he taught. They were uh, they never heard someone who taught like he did. And often you'll find in the Gospels where they'll say, he doesn't teach like our teachers of the law. But just after that story, as amazing as Jesus' teaching was even that day, the text says that they were amazed at his teaching. When Jesus got up, when they realized that he had taught them that he was actually the Messiah who had actually come, the one that Isaiah had been speaking about, Jesus was that person, the text says that they walked him to the, the side of a cliff with the hope, with the intention of pushing him over the side. They were in the very presence of the Messiah, but failed to recognize his greatness. And so time and again in the Gospels, we read stories of those who should have recognized him, those who were prepared to know who Jesus was, and yet when Jesus was in their presence, they failed to recognize who he really was. But there was one day when all the city was abuzz. There was one day in Jerusalem where everyone recognized and proclaimed that Jesus was king. What happened that day on Jesus, the day of Jesus' triumphal entry? What was happening that day for everyone to recognize that Jesus was, in fact, the king of kings? What was different about that day than maybe some of the other days when Jesus was in people's presence and they didn't recognize who he was. So if you have your Bibles open, I invite you to look at Matthew 21. We're going to look at verses 1 to 11, and the word should also appear on the screen behind me. What occurred on the one day when everyone recognized Jesus as king? Let's look at the text. As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them, and he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. He is humble riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. 
Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God for the Son of David! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Praise God in the highest heaven! The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. And the crowds replied, It is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. What was happening the one day in Jesus' life and ministry when the whole town recognized that he was, in fact, the king of kings? The first thing I'd like you to see from our text is that the disciples obeyed. And they didn't just obey in in a way that made sense and when Jesus' instructions were all clear. They obeyed when they didn't really fully understand. And we'll see, it says very directly in verse 6 that the disciples obeyed. They did just as Jesus commanded. Well, what had Jesus asked them to do? Jesus was traveling from, excuse me, Jesus was traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem. And he was coming as pilgrims were coming, traveling to the city to celebrate the great feast, the Passover. And so many people were traveling. Now, if you have been to Israel, I know some of you here have been to Israel, you'll know that Jericho is down by the Dead Sea, and it's actually the lowest point on the earth. It's about 1,200 feet below sea level. And of course, if you remember, Reading in your Gospels, you'll read that people are always going up to Jerusalem. Well, why are they always going up to Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem is up in the hill country. And from whatever direction you're traveling to Jerusalem, you're always going up to Jerusalem. You're climbing the hill country to get up to Jerusalem. So Jesus had a 20-mile walk from Jericho, which is the lowest part of the earth. Uh, And he, he walked with other pilgrims about 20 miles but it was a steady incline. It was an ascent uh, for about 20 miles to about 2,500 feet above sea level. So it was quite an arduous journey, and he did that on foot with many other pilgrims. Jesus could have been tired. Jesus had a a long uphill battle. Uh, As he's entering Jerusalem, he's going to die. He's going to give his life for you, and he's going to give his life for me. And as they're going, you remember that Uh, A few summers ago, we did a series through the Psalms, and we saw some of the Psalms of Ascent. Um, If you look in the Psalms from Psalm 120 to 134, there's a series of Psalms that pilgrims, as they're traveling to Jerusalem, as they're ascending the hills up to Mount Zion, where Jerusalem is nestled up in the hills, there was a series of 14 Psalms that the pilgrims would sing, and they would recite together as they're traveling, maybe to keep them focused on the Lord and focused on the reason why they're going. And so Jesus is traveling on this hard uphill ascent into Jerusalem. And as he approaches, he takes two of his disciples aside and tells them this. He says, I want you to go into the next town. There's a donkey and a colt. Now we know from the other gospels, all the gospels record the triumphal entry. It's a significant event in the life of Christ. And one of the other gospels tells us that The colt has never been ridden before, but he he sends the disciples into the town. He says, as you enter the town, you will see a donkey and a colt that has never been ridden. I want you to untie them and bring them to me. Someone will stop you. Jesus knew it would happen. And if someone stops you and asks, just say, the Lord needs it. Now, it's interesting that he doesn't say, go into the town ahead. Find the owner of the donkey and the colt. Explain to the owner of the donkey and the colt that the Lord needs your donkey and colt. Please let him borrow it. He says, first go and take it. And as you're leaving with the donkey and colt, someone will ask you. So the instructions he has given to the disciples, now they don't know how the rest of the day is going to play out. They don't know about the amazing procession that God has orchestrated. They don't know about how everyone at that moment is going to recognize Jesus as the coming king. They're told to go and take a donkey and a colt, and if someone asks, to just say, the Lord needs it. Now, I imagine if you and I had been uh, one of those two disciples and we had scampered off to do what Jesus had told us, we could have second-guessed. 
we could have had overanalyzed the mission that Jesus had sent us on. Are we really supposed to take this? Um, we're not even supposed to find the owner first and explain what we're doing. What if someone you know, accuses us of being thieves? What if we get stoned? What if we get locked in jail? Jesus said, go and untie the donkey and untie the colt and to bring it to him. If someone asks, we are to say, the Lord needs it. So humanly speaking, Jesus' instructions might not have really made sense. But verse 6 says, the disciples obeyed as the Lord commanded. The one day in Jesus' life and ministry, when the whole world seemed to recognize that Jesus was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, on that day, one thing that happened was that his disciples obeyed. His disciples were obedient, even if they didn't completely understand everything that Jesus was asking them to do. On the day when Jesus was recognized as king, his disciples obeyed. Simple obedience to what Jesus asks us to do is never wrong. It's always the right thing to do. And I think so many things in our Christian life we can overanalyze. So many things we make so complicated that we end up not doing the simple truths that God has asked us to do. And I put a little list, if you have the sermon handout there, I put a, a simple list, and these are things you've heard numerous times. I'm not the only preacher that tells you these things. You've heard this time and again. Reading Scripture, praying, serving others, witnessing, giving generously to kingdom work, living in community with other believers, joining God on His mission, these are basic truths that God asks his disciples to do. What about being baptized? It, you say, well, baptism? Is it really that important? If, I, if my sins are forgiven, it's because God has forgiven my sins. What is going down in water and coming up out of the water? That's not going to wash away my sins. So why is it necessary? Why is it important? Or we'll say, uh, witnessing. Well, people in the world today... Uh, they're kind of hostile to the faith. Uh, they don't believe anyways. They've heard other ways. There's people on the radio. Everyone has heard the good news and they've rejected it. What is my witnessing going to change? And so there's many ways in which God has asked us to do simple and basic things in the Christian life, and we overanalyze them. We argue and we don't end up being obedient. The one day when Jesus was recognized, as being the King of kings and Lord of lords, his disciples obeyed, even if they didn't completely understand why Jesus had sent them in to get this donkey and the colt that no one had ever ridden on. Why is the church of Jesus Christ so lethargic? Why are we moving so slowly? What are things in your life that you're failing to obey? Things that are clear in Scripture that God wants all of his children to be about. What is the lack of obedience in your life? It might be different in my life from your life, but I think one of the things that we can all do is seek to obey our Lord, even in the simple things, and not overanalyze them or decide that we don't need to do them. The second thing I'd like to show you is that the disciples proclaimed him publicly. Now, if you look at, I read the, this story in the four Gospels, and John's Gospel brings out something that Matthew doesn't tell us. And it's in John 12, 12. You don't need to turn there now. But in John 12, 12, we read this, that those who um, spread their garments along the road and those who cut palm branches, those who were um, proclaiming the goodness, the kingship of the one who was riding into Jerusalem that day, John 12, 12, 12, 12 says it's the other pilgrims who were coming up to Jerusalem for the Passover. So I want you to see, now I, I put in my handout here, verses 1 to 6, you could bracket that off, and that's Jesus talking to his disciples. But if you look at verses 8, 9, those are the author of those verses there, the, not the author of the verses, but the actor in those verses are the pilgrims, the other pilgrims that have come from the countryside, people that are traveling to Jerusalem, 
those who are singing the Psalms of Ascent as they are traveling together to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And then if you look at 9 and 10, we see there the whole city, the residents of Jerusalem. That's where the whole city is a buzz, and people are saying, who is this? What's happening? Oh my goodness, this looks so exciting. Apparently a king is coming, and all of the city. So you have the disciples traveling with Jesus. You have the larger crowd of pilgrims who are also traveling to Jerusalem, and then you have those who are resident in the city, and they're the ones who are sort of the subject of verses 10 and 11. And so what we learn from John's gospel, chapter 12, verse 12, is that those who were saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, praise God for the son of David, praise God in the highest, were the other pilgrims, those who were coming from Nazareth, those who were coming from Galilee, Jews who lived outside of Jerusalem, Jews who had been much more receptive of Jesus' ministry, all along the way, those who recognized Bill Walton when they saw him, those who recognized Jesus for who he was, they were the ones who were proclaiming um, how wonderful it was and proclaiming that he was actually the king. But I want you to see that they were proclaiming this even though Jesus didn't look like a king. Jesus was not arriving in the way kings typically arrive. First of all, we see that he comes in complete meekness. He gets a donkey and a colt that has never been ridden on. Jesus does not come riding into Jerusalem on a big white stallion. Now, he's going to come back. Revelation 19 tells us that when Jesus comes back, he will come back on a large white horse. It will be an awesome sight, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But at the, the triumphal entry, he comes in meekness. He comes on a colt that has never been ridden on. Now, I read several commentaries on this passage, and they said um, they emphasized the donkey being there, the mother of the colt. And it could well be that both were needed to fulfill the prophecy from Zechariah. Jesus needed to be riding a colt that had never been ridden on. But the presence of the mother of the colt might have had a calming effect on that colt. Think of the crowd. There's a huge crowd of pilgrims. They're shouting. They're singing praises to the one who's riding on the colt. They've taken their cloaks off and spread them onto the ground. They're waving palm branches, and this colt has never been ridden on. It's a screaming crowd. All kinds of things are being thrown in its path, and now Jesus gets on the back of the colt. It must have been a very scary event, and that's probably why the mother uh, was brought with it. With it. But Matthew wants you to see that Jesus comes in meekness. Jesus doesn't even own his own donkey. Jesus doesn't even own his own colt. He had to borrow his steed, his, his glorious steed from a nearby village. And that doesn't surprise us because all of Jesus' life and ministry has been done from a position of meekness, even weakness. The Son of God was born in a manger, in a stable. There was no room for him in the inn. And when people wanted to follow him, he reminded them that the Son of Man had no way, nowhere to lay his head. Jesus came in meekness. Jesus came in weakness. He didn't win us over because of his political power. He didn't win us over because of his physical might. He didn't force us to follow him. He came in weakness. He came from the ground up. It, Isaiah says there's nothing striking about him. When you saw Jesus, you didn't see him and say, wow, what a handsome, strong, Samson-like man who stands head and shoulders above the crowd. Look at those muscles. Look at that leadership that comes beaming from him. Isaiah says, no, there was nothing striking about his appearance. He, he was bruised. He was perhaps even ugly. He was a very simple man. He came in weakness. He didn't have all the accoutrements, all the fancy clothes. He didn't have a chariot. He didn't have a big war horse. He came in weakness. He associated with the weak people of the earth, with the low people of the earth. From the beginning of his ministry to the very end, he associated with those who were weak, with those who were lepers, with those who were outcasts 
with those who were not liked by others. He was their Lord. He was their king. He had come for them. He fed them when they were hungry. He healed them when they needed to be healed. He was their Lord. He was their Savior. He loved them. He didn't come as a king until that day. He had come in weakness. And I want you to think about <clears throat> how many times in Scripture we see that. Now, I preached this a couple of years ago, but when Joshua takes command, when, when Moses passes away and leadership is given to the children of Israel and they're about to enter the promised land, two things happened the day before they attacked Jericho. The men had not been circumcised for 40 years. And God said, all right, before you enter and take possession of the land, circumcise all the men. The second thing, they had been fed miraculously with manna and quail for 40 years in the desert. And the day they stepped into the promised land, God said, the miraculous provision of food is going to stop. No more manna. No more quail. Joshua, you're going to be a leader. You're going to enter into that promised land. You're going to attack Jericho. First, I'm going to disable all your fighting men. We're going to circumcise them. Secondly, no more free food. You're going to have to make this work. And if you had been Joshua, you would have said, Lord, first of all, I'm a young, inexperienced leader. At least Moses, he had, right? He saw you at the burning bush. People listened to Moses. He stood up to Pharaoh. He, he had a lot of uh, authority. Who am I? I'm the new young leader. And now you're taking the food away? Now you're, you know, you're disabling all my fighting men? How is this going to work? And God says, it's going to work because you're going to play by my rules. It's not because of the strength of your sword you're going to win the day. It's because you obey me. You're going you're to march around the city of Jericho. You're going to worship, and you're going to praise the Lord, and you're going to leave the victory up to me. And that's what they did. And they were victorious over Jericho, not because their muscles were bigger than those on the inside of the walls, not because of their weapons were better, but because God was God, and God was on their side. God loves to work in weakness. God loves to bless those who depend on him by faith, who take steps of faith even in their weakness, but trusting in God, he loves to bless what they do. Now, I wonder, would it be easier for us to witness to our friends if the church of Jesus Christ always looked good? If everyone who was sick and prayed was miraculously healed, would it be easier for us to witness to our friends? If evangelical Christians always looked good on the world's scheme and the world's scene, maybe we'd say, hey, that's the church I belong to. We're a pretty good church. Look at all the wonderful things that our church has done and that God is doing. You know, our church is kind of weak, but that's okay because God isn't. God loves to bless those who, who believe in him, who have faith in him, even when, by all appearances, we shouldn't be able to do what we are doing, but we have faith and we trust God anyway. I had a privilege of just spending a week in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has been prayed. I love Ben's, where is he? I love Ben's prayer. Uh, ben, ben is very cognizant of the rest of the world when he prays, and that just makes my heart sing with joy when I hear the way he prays. Um, people in Bangladesh, Christians, are a tiny, tiny minority. And uh, I just spent a week with 22 Christian leaders. Many of them were women. They are doing very courageous things in a very dark part of the world. You cannot go there and see what God is doing and not come away and say, God loves to bless people who are weak, who are meek, who don't have a lot of resources, but they trust God. They put their faith forward, they step into the Jordan River, and then they find that the waters part and they're able to walk by faith because God is with them. It's unbelievable. This last month, the front cover of Voice of the Martyrs, once again, is Burkina Faso. It's on the front cover. More pastors have been killed in Burkina Faso. It makes my heart, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's where I've lived much of my life and worked. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is going forward in places where the church is weak, where people don't have um, all the things we think we need for ministry to go forward. We have the Lord, and he's asked us to, to have faith and to pray and to take steps of faith, and he blesses them. Think about the early church and how it grew. We've been working through the book of Acts. We took a, a, a brief respite from that during our spiritual adventure, 
But I hope you've been able to see some of these themes that have come back time and again in the book of Acts. Jesus did not build buildings. Jesus did not open a big bank account and give debit cards to his disciples and say, when you go out in mission, you're going to need a lot of money. Uh, the first bank of Jerusalem, I have an account open for you. All you 11 disciples will add Paul in there to make it 12 again. And uh, you have bank accounts. You have cards. When you need money, just go by to the ATM and you have all the money you need. Jesus never wrote a book. Jesus never started a school. Jesus never built anything. He invested in a few people. He loved them. Ministry was relational. He spoke into their lives. He read scripture over them. He taught them God's word. He prayed for them. He prayed with them. He took them with him for ministry. They saw how he got involved in the, the grime of life how he touched people that no one else would touch, how he loved people that were outcasts in society. They saw him do ministry because they were close by. Ministry was highly relational. It wasn't dependent on stuff. It wasn't dependent on money. And that's why the church of Jesus Christ is going forward in places like Haiti. When you look at Haiti, humanly speaking, you think, how in God's world can people even survive there? let alone do evangelism campaigns and, and, and do discipleship. And people are coming to the Lord in one of the most chaotic places on earth right now. How are people coming to the Lord in Burkina? How are four foot eight little Muslim converted women who have become Christians um, starting orphanages in Bangladesh and discipling other women? How, how is the church of Jesus Christ going forward in leaps and bounds in places like Bangladesh if it wasn't for the Lord? You see, the Lord loves to take people who have faith in him, people who are humble, but people who love the Lord and people who depend on him in prayer. He loves to take those people and do amazing things through them. You know, the, for, for years, the early church grew without church buildings, little home churches, little house churches all over the Mediterranean world. Men and women whose lives had been changed by Jesus would meet. And they might have little scraps of scripture. They didn't have CBD. They didn't have Amazon. They didn't have devices with multiple uh, versions of scripture. They had little portions of scripture. Maybe they had a letter from Paul, but that meant something to them. They treated it as though it was scripture. They prayed for each other. They encouraged one another. And God did amazing things. And the church of Jesus Christ spread all throughout the world. And we are those who have inherited it today. And now the last group, is the whole city was in an uproar. Look at what the text says again, the last few verses, verses 10 and 11. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. Who is this man coming on a cult? He's got dirty clothes. He's a very simple guy. He's got a mob with him waving palm branches. He's not riding a chariot. He's not riding on a big white horse. He doesn't wear big armor with a big sword and a spear. Who is this? And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, the gospel writers want you to see Nazareth, and they want that to hit you between the eyes like as though you were Goliath. Nazareth? Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Why, yes. In fact, it's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Here he is on a colt with dirty clothes, about to be killed. Yes. Quite ironically, it's the King of Kings. It's Jesus who's come. Sometimes the glory of Christ is obscured by those closest to him. But on that day, Jesus' disciples obeyed, even when it didn't make sense. On that day, the crowds publicly proclaimed him to be king, even in a time when it could have cost them his life. And of course, the entire city was a buzz. I, I love that verse in Psalm 24. Who is this king of glory? We even have a song. The Lord strong in battle, the king of glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? I imagine that being sung as Jesus was entering on a little cult that had never been written, who might have been scared because of the crowd who had his mother near them. Here he is. He doesn't look like the king of glory, but he is. And now, the most surprising twist of all, here he is, the Messiah, the King. 
He's come on his colt. Crowds are there. They're obeying him. They're publicly proclaiming him. And the first thing he does, what does he do after he comes into the temple? He cleanses the temple. You would have thought, oh my goodness, here he is, the king of kings. He's going to free us from Rome. We hate the Romans. The Romans, they control us. They're our colonial master. We don't like the Romans. We've been waiting for the Messiah to come. Oh my goodness, we're going to make Israel great again. Here he comes, the son of David. Notice they're calling him the son of David, the King David. He's come. He's going to make us great again. He's going to get the Romans out of here. He goes to the temple. He goes to the heart of their worship, and he overturns the temple, uh, the tables of those who are, are there for the wrong reasons. Jesus has come for spiritual reasons, most of all. Jesus has come to speak life into our hearts. Jesus has come to turn our hearts aright towards God. That's why he's come. He's not come as a political hero. He's come to pay for our sins. And I wonder if we have submitted to him as Lord and Savior. You know, there might be areas in your life where you haven't been obedient, and this Easter season you can be obedient. You can start to do the kinds of things that Jesus has asked you to do. Because obeying what Jesus asks is never wrong. You can also submit your life to him and make him Lord, your Lord and Savior so that just as the crowds, the pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem that day recognized him for who he was, maybe in your life you can recognize him too to be your king and to be your Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I thank you, Lord, that we can know you, that we can have a relationship with you, that we can come to you and have our sins forgiven, and we can connect with the God of the universe. Father, I pray for each person here. I pray that you will be working in our hearts today and every day going forward so that we can know you and that we can walk in the way you designed us to walk. We thank you, Lord. We worship you today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us, as we forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil one. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done On earth as in heaven Right here in my heart Father, let your kingdom come Father, let your will be done On earth as in heaven Right here in my heart Give us this day your daily bread Forgive us, forgive us as we forgive the ones who sinned against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours, forever and ever. The kingdom is yours, it's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. The kingdom, the power, the glory are yours, it's 
Father, we thank you so much for your goodness, for your faithfulness. We pray that you would work your kingdom purposes out through us today and for the rest of this week. We thank you, Lord. We lift your name on high. We praise these things in Jesus' name. Amen.